Okay, welcome to spring, and uh, hopefully life will start getting a bit better soon. We're still in lockdown. But to put it in perspective, um, in Nepal, it's believed that over 300 pastors in the church have died there of COVID. Another report talking about Nepal and India said that over 2,000 Christian workers or pastors have died there as a result of COVID. And I read a very sad report of a church in Afghanistan that while the person was on the phone, the uh, people in Afghanistan said, we're willing to die for our faith. They said they were very encouraged that even their children said, we will die for Jesus. And then a whole lot of gunshots um, uh, fired out. The phone went dead and it was obvious that the whole church had been killed. So we are living in very uh, rough times and we're grateful that we can be together spiritually, if not together personally. So let us encourage each other. And today our sermon is going to be looking at 1 Timothy and we're up to chapter 5 and it's the first 16 verses there. And the main uh, issue for this is widows and how should we treat the older ladies within our church. So how do we treat different people? It's probably the big question. And we're told uh, in the scriptures that we should view the church as and church members as members of our family. The older men we should treat as fathers, older women as if they're our mothers, those who are the same age as our brothers and sisters, and those who are younger than us, we should be looking at them as if they are our children. So the first key thing to understand as Christian is that we to treat each other as family members. And this is a massive mindset change in about how we should treat people. It's about being loving and being respectful. So when we meet as a church, we're not a crowd. We're not an audience. We're not just viewers or onlookers. We're not concert goers or spectators, but we are family. And even when we're apart, physically, spiritually, we are to be family. So the early church called each other's brothers and sisters. So what does this mean? How should a family mean and act towards each other? And just a couple of scriptures. The first is Hebrews 10, verse 24. Let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, to neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So though we can't be together as a physical church, we can encourage each other, pray for each other, uh, ring each other up and support each other. And in Romans 12 verse 10 it says that, one, that we should love one another with brotherly affection, uh, outdo one another in showing honour. Then uh, Jesus says in Matthew 12 49 that stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said to them, Here are my mother and my brothers. For if it does the will of my Father in heaven, is my brother, my sister, and my mother. So what does it mean for us as Christians? Ephesians 2.19 So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. And so the key thing is, as Christians, this is how we should view each other. The second key part of this passage is that families are defined by the love of God. So there in Ephesians uh, 4, 5, uh, 23, it says the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church's body and is himself its saviour. So what did it cost Jesus to be the head of the church? It cost him his life. Then in verse uh, 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So there's a real sense that our love should be sacrificial. And it says uh, in uh, 1 Timothy 5, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Now the ancient Greek word or verb here for rebuke is not the normal word that is used for rebuke in the rest of the New Testament. And this is the only place this word is used. And it literally means to strike at. So Timothy was told not to attack older men with words, but to treat them with respect. The command was not that Timothy must never rebuke older men, but he must not strike out at people or lash out. And he must not be overtly harsh in his rebuke. It goes on in chapter 5, verse 1, uh, talking about younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Now, as it is in the New Testament times, there's really not a great warfare network like we have here in Australia today. And so it's a sense that we support those who are powerless. So the big question we need to ask ourselves is who are the powerless in our society? Now in Jesus' day, it was often said to be widows and orphans 
or those who were sick or poor, but in modern times, who are our powers? Now, when I Googled this, because this is the first uh, probably 10 entries that talked about powerless people were the people who were alcoholics or drug addicts. But if you look in our society, there are many people who have silent hurts and that many people just never see them. For instance, there's the whole issue of domestic violence. Now, it's shocking what's happening to, uh, to many of the wives out there, but there's also a number of men who have been abused in domestic violence relationships. Many of these men feel they cannot go to the police, they feel they'll be laughed at, and they cannot seek safety. So they are what you call one of the silent hurt groups within our society who really do feel powerless and do not feel they even can share or talk about it with other people. Now, who are so powerless and the people who struggle? Those with mental and uh, medical issues, especially those who have ailments that cannot be easily seen or easily diagnosed. I have a lovely friend who suffers from uh, severe nerve damage. He has a disabled parking space uh, sticker. And when he gets out of his car, many people look at him and thinking, you know, what are you doing parking there? You look like you can walk okay. But he spends his whole life in constant pain. Outwardly, looks okay. But inwardly, he really does struggle. So let's go back to widows. So how does God view widows? In uh, Psalm 68, verse 5, Father of the fatherless, is a this way of describing God, and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. And in Deuteronomy 10, verse 18, he defends the cause of the fatherless and of the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. Compassion is at the very heart of God's nature. So the big question, if God views uh, the, the uh, widow's and the orphans in this way, how should we treat and view orphans and widows? In Exodus 22, 22, do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry, says God. One of the most classic passages is that of James 1, 27, religion that the God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this look after the orphans and widows in their distress. So what does it mean for you and I to have compassion? And uh, Paul, when he describes his own compassion, when he looked at his own struggles he'd gone through, he tells the uh, Christians in uh, Corinth, in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in trouble with the comfort we ourselves received from God. So you and I, as Christians, are called to be compassionate and loving, just as God and as Jesus is compassionate and loving. So the big question we need to look at then is how do we practically provide welfare for widows? Now when Paul talks about widows, he's not just talking about every woman who's lost her husband, but he's uh, talking about these widows as a defined group of people who do not have any family support or other networks that can help them. So we see um, a number of times in the scripture it talks about a welfare network they had provided. So in Deuteronomy 24 verse 19, it says, When you are harvesting your crops and forget to bring in a bundle of grain from the field, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigners, orphans and widows, then the Lord your God will bless you in all that you do. And going on to the next verse, when you beat the olives from your olive trees, don't go over the boughs twice. Leave the remaining olives for the foreigners, the orphans, and the widows. Then Deuteronomy 24, 21, when you gather grapes in your vineyard, don't glean the vines after they are picked. Leave the remaining grapes for the foreigners, the orphans, and the widows. So there's a sense that you would just practically leave stuff behind. Just, so you don't just grab the stuff and give it to them personally, but you provide them the opportunity to collect it themselves. Then in Deuteronomy 26, verse 12, Every third year you must offer a special tithe of the crops. In this year of the special tithe, you must give your tithes to the Levites, foreigners, orphans, and widows. 
so that they will have enough to eat in your towns. Then that's to verse 13. Then you must declare in the presence of the Lord your God, I have taken the sacred gift from my house and has given it to the Levites, the foreigners, the orphans, the widows, just as you have commanded me. A couple of chapters earlier in Deuteronomy 15, verse 10, give generously to the poor, not grudgingly, for the Lord your God will bless you with everything you do. So when we turn to the New Testament, what is the New Testament teaching about the poor? Galatians 6.10 so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. We've looked at how we are to treat widows and in the next section, we look at how they are to behave as widows. So how is a widow to behave? Going back to 1 Timothy verse, uh, five, uh, chapter 5, verse 3. Honour win- widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness into their own household and make some return to their parents for this is pleasing in the sight of God. As Christians we are responsible for our parents and our grandparents that uh, they never stop being our family. So what are widows to be like? And it is one of the first and core values of being a widow was to pray. So there in verse 5, She who is truly widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. And so the core value, if you're an older person, is that you have the ability to be a prayer warrior. I must say, one of the first things Jenny and I do when we first wake up each morning is that we pray together. And we see that as one of the, uh, the greatest blessings of being a married couple. Then in verse 7 it says, Command these things as well so they may be without reproach. So there'd be people of honour, of integrity, to be loving and to be caring. The next section, Paul looks at what widows are not to be. It starts off with the idea of self-indulgence. So there in verse 6, for she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. And then it makes a a distinction between older and younger widows. So the younger widows, it says in verse uh, 13, Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house. And not only idlers, but they are gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. And so it's very clear that uh, you, you're not there to have a chat fest and gossip about other people. Now the fourth section that Paul deals with here is how therefore should the families treat their widows? And we're told by uh, Jesus in Matthew 26, 11, you will always have the poor among you. So the poor, the orphans and widows are a reality of our life and that will be to the day that Jesus returns. Then in Mark 14, 7 it says, you will always have the poor among you and you can help them whenever you want to. Now as interesting as you go through a number of passages in the Bible, you can see there's an underlying theme of caring for the poor. So when Jesus talks to the rich man, the rich man says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' response is, go and sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven. And uh, then come, follow me. So Jesus saw one of the greatest gifts this rich man could do was to give to those who struggle. Now when a woman comes with a whole lot of perfume and pours it out on Jesus' feet, what was the response by some of the disciples? It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. Then we find in uh, Luke 14, verse 12, when you put on a luncheon or a banquet, don't invite your friends and brothers, uh, relatives and rich neighbours, for they'll invite you back and they will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind. And uh, when uh, Zacchaeus uh, makes a response when Jesus comes to visit his house, part of his response of, of, of his practical conversion is, he says, I'll give half my wealth to the poor. And so as you see in Scripture everywhere, the idea of helping the poor is just this very essential nature of us being Christians. It should be just who we are. And when we look at Jesus and his own disciples, what did they do with the poor? They uh, lived by faith. Uh, there was been a, a, you know, a large group of uh, people that had to be fed every day. 
They lived by what people gave them. And we see in John 13, verse 29, that talking about Judas, who was their treasure, some thought Jesus was telling him to go and pay for food and give some money to the poor. And this, of course, is on the Thursday night when Jesus meets with his disciples before his crucifixion. And also we can see uh, in the book of Acts, Cornelius was seen as a captain. He was a devout and God-fearing man there in Acts chapter 10, as was everyone in his household. And one of the ways he's described that he gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. Then verse 31, he, to uh, he told me, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard, because Cornelius wanted uh, a child to be healed. And says, your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Now, in the early church, Paul often would write about the poor. So in Romans 15, verse 26, For you see the believers in Macedonia and Achaia have eagerly taken up an offering for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. And when it comes to giving, how should we therefore give? What is the, uh, the sign of a good, godly way to give? And 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3 says, If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body... I can't boast about it. But if I haven't uh, loved others, I would have gained nothing. So not only do we give to the poor, but we need to be giving lovingly, compassionately, and generously. So in Galatians 2.10 it says, the only suggestion was that, that we keep on helping the poor. And Paul says, I'm always eager to do this. So Paul saw that his ministry was one. Yes, he would collect money for evangelistic work but he would also put as much effort to look after those Christians who were poor now in the early church there were a number who were poor because if you had been Jewish and became a Christian you may be ostracized by your family you may lose your job especially in Jerusalem because so many jobs were tied to the temple worship that uh, many of the Christians really did struggle in their conversion and so it goes on in 1 uh, Timothy 5 it talks about how should we therefore treat our members of our own family who are struggling. And it says there in verse 8, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for members of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so they may take care for those who are truly widows. So what are the two things they're saying? You should care for your family and also the church saw one of its roles was the care for those who are widows. The next part, Paul looks at older widows. So there in verse 9, Let a widow be enrolled if she's not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband. So what's the godly signs of an older widow? Verse 10, having the reputation for good works, if she's brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. So uh, one of the things we should look at our godly older women is they should be godly examples. They shouldn't be sitting there gossiping, they shouldn't be whinging, uh, they shouldn't be berating people, but they should be there giving words of encouragement and support. The next part he looks at younger widows, and I think there's no sense of saying those widows who are young enough to get married again. So there in verse 11, but refuse to enroll younger widows for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their full of faith. But it talks about them being allowed to marry. So in verse 14, so I would have younger widows marry, bear children, and manage their households. Go on living. And this will give the adversary no occasion for slander. Then in verse 15, For some have already strayed from Satan, and what can take you away from day? Because we are family. If we love and respect each other, we as Christians are called to care for the poor, the powerless, the widows, the orphans. And if you're an older woman, to lead a life of love and prayer and pastor and care for the younger women. We're to care for our extended family as Christians. We're told that we shouldn't be inspired by this, by the death of Jesus on the cross for you and I. His example is our model of how we should live. 
He saved us by his grace and we're called also to live by that very, very same grace. So in summary, how, what should we do? We should care for those who are powerless and struggle in our society. And very much those who are part of our church should always be part of our care network. Secondly, for those in the extended world, we should be showing care towards them. And one of the signs of the early church was that they would often take in orphans and uh, regularly um, uh, married couples would decide not to have, want a child and the child would be just left out in the middle of the wilderness to die and to be eaten by wild animals. And the Christians would go and collect these children and raise them as their own. I remember seeing a uh, very, very delightful quote. A man said, I have two kids who are adopted and two kids that were born to my wife. My problem is, I can't remember which ones were adopted and which ones were born to us. Because that is how we should be acting towards those who struggle. May today's sermon be an encouragement to you. And I look forward to us meeting again soon. Let's finish in prayer. Father God, open our eyes to those around us who struggle. Father, teach us to be generous, to be giving, to be supportive in all that we say and all we do. May our eyes be fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. As he came to save us by grace, may we live by that same grace towards others. Farewell. Amen.